He's a professor of moral philosophy at St. Anne's College, Oxford. And he's written widely on ethics, including its history, especially ancient ethics and British moral philosophy since Hobbes, ethical theory, meta-ethics, and practical ethics. And today, he's going to be discussing prices ethics with respect to the prima facie overall duty distinction. So a warm welcome to you, Roger. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Hugh. And uh, thank you to the rest of you uh, and all of you for your patience in allowing me to um, take part in this important uh, event. I'm actually in Rome at the International uh, Society for Utilitarian Studies. Uh, and I think Price in particular would be uh, disapproving of that since he was one of the first people to see the problems with utilitarianism. And I might as well start by saying that I think Price's review um, was the, the best statement of non-consequentialist, non-utilitarian ethics uh, since Aristotle. I think um, book three of Sidgwick's ethics, though he's criticizing deontological ethics, is as good, but he learned a lot from Price. There's no doubt about that. And I do apologize for the jargon in my title. It, I am going to put that into ordinary language in, in a moment. My, when my wife heard what I was talking about, she said I should call the paper Price is Right. But I thought that that might also be inappropriate to the seriousness of the occasion. So let's, let's get going, um, if we can. So I'm not going to start with Price. I'm going to start with Sir David Ross, who was a very distinguished um, moral philosopher, intuitionist moral philosopher, working mainly in Oxford in the last century. And uh, Ross's two ethical works uh, were um, very, very widely appreciated during his lifetime. He was really quite influential, particularly in the case of his first book, The Right and the, the Good. And uh, another quite important philosopher of the time, A.C. Ewing, who had what he calls some second thoughts in philosophy and published them in uh, a book in the 1950s, said that he thought Ross's distinction between prima facie duty and overall duty was one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century in moral philosophy. And uh, the, the now sadly missed um, Philip Stratton Lake in his superb edition of um, Ross's book with a, a substantial introduction um, really goes along with this, and he there are two particular things he likes about the distinction. The first is that it allows for the the idea that you can break a promise for the greater good without your thinking you've got to be a utilitarian. Um, and it also avoids tragic conflicts. There'll always be a right thing to do. So just to spell out really the 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 the, 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 the nature of the um, the, 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 this distinction, it really is, when you think about it, I think, rather obvious. It's just the distinction between the idea that there are some duties that you have, for example, to tell the truth or to be kind or to keep your promises and so on. And these are what Ross is calling prima facie duties. They're duties you have all the time. And then there's your overall duty in any particular situation. Because these, these duties can come into conflict with one another and then you have to decide what to do. And that, if you've got it right, would be your overall duty. So one might think, well, why didn't Ross just call it the distinction between duty and overall duty? And I think that's a good, a good uh, question. 
in the book, he actually apologizes for using the the language of prima facie um, duty because it sounds like it's not really a duty. It's just a, on the face of it a duty, but it's not really. And in fact, if he if he had to use a Latin tag, pro tanto would have been better, um, and that would have brought out um, the, the the contrast between um, duties and uh, one's overall duty in any particular situation. Okay, so here is um, what Ross says. This is the the first account that he he gives. So he says, I suggest prima facie duty or conditional duty as a brief way of referring to the characteristic quite distinct from that of being a duty proper. That's that's duty overall. He sometimes uses that phrase as well, which an act has in virtue of being a certain kind, e.g. the keeping of a promise of being an act which would be a duty proper if it were not at the same time of another kind, which is morally significant. Um, so I've said, you know, Ross apologizes uh, for this. And I think he's, he, as I say, I think he is, he is um, right, to, right to do that, though he doesn't actually apologize for giving a conditional account. And I think actually it's unnecessary to do that. In fact, it's a bit confusing because it sounds on the face of it as if he's just giving an account of what it is to be a duty when it's in conflict with another duty. But that's that's not enough. He needs to give an, an account of what a duty is independently of its potential conflict with another uh, duty. So it's a bit like, imagine you've never seen a balance before. Um, you know, the standard kind of balance you used to see in uh, old fashioned shops. I can still remember them. Um, from the 1960s and 70s, where, where you, you, you essentially have, you know, two, uh, two, two, two pounds on either side, and then the, uh, the shopkeeper would 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 put weights into the, the balance. If somebody says to you, well, what's that? They're pointing at a weight. It, it would be a bit odd to say, well, it's a kind of thing you put in here, which you then put another thing um, on the other side to balance. Just much more straightforward to talk about what it is to be a weight and then explain the, the balance afterwards. Now, another person who was around at the same time as Ross was, of course, H.A. Pritchard. And they, they, they had um, a great deal of interaction, um, many of which survives in, um, in their papers in Oxford, which I hope, more, more, more of which I hope will be published uh, at some stage. But Pritchard has a go himself. And he says what Ross needs to talk about is not the idea of prima facie duty, but uh, the, a claim. And Ross rejects that quite rightly, I think. He says, while claim is appropriate from their point of view, we want the first person with the claim, we want a word to express the corresponding fact from the agent's point of view. The fact of his being subject to claims that can be made against him and ordinary language provides us with no such correlative to claim. Uh, and that seems to me a very odd thing for Ross to say, because, of course, it does. I mean, we've already got the word duty. So I think they got themselves into some uh, some muddles, Ross and Pritchard. Um, uh, and, and, and there's um, one of them. OK, he, so later on in the writing of good, Ross seems to give up on the conditional uh, account. And he very briefly offers what I'm calling the tendency account of uh, prima facie duties. And we don't mean tendency in the sense of um, uh, you know, any sort of likelihood or anything like that. It's a sort of disposition that something has. So it, it, he's using the word to tend as you would if you said, well, 
that ship is tending to starboard. That's the idea. So Ross says, uh, quite subject to the force of gravitation towards some other body, each body tends to move in a particular direction with a particular velocity, but its actual movement depends on all the forces to which it's subject. That seems to be more helpful. It's the idea that somehow reasons are um, reasons have a particular weight or a particular force, and you, somehow you have to calculate them. Um, so you know it's quite natural for us to talk about one reason as being weightier than another, and then and then the idea is you go for the the balance. And that seems to me a very straightforward idea. Some people, uh, Philip uh, Stratton Lake being one of them, say that we should talk about prima facie duties as moral reasons. Not really convinced by that because. If you believe in super erogation, the idea that you can have reasons to do things which go beyond your duty, um, you you don't want to say that um, all moral reasons are equivalent to the idea of prima facie duty. So I think we, can, we could put it in terms of reasons, but not necessarily moral ones. And actually, it seems such a plausible account, helpful account, that I think the various articulations that Ross and Pritchard um, used are to some extent unnecessary and that brings us to Price now Ross had read uh, Price but I suspect um, perhaps it forgot some of the things he he came across there so here, here are some things that Price says in the um, review of the principal questions in morals truth and right in all circumstances require one determinate way of acting, but so variously may different obligations combine with or oppose each other in particular cases, and so imperfect are our discerning faculties that it cannot but happen that we should be frequently in the dark. Now that seems spot on. It's often very difficult to tell what your duties are, and you do it by um, thinking about them and comparing them. And Price then goes on, in order to discover what's right in the case, we ought to extend our views to all the different heads of virtue, by which he means, as it were, the different virtues, justice, benevolence, um, piety, and so on, to examine how far each is concerned and compare their influence and demands. So this is starting to sound very like the tendency account. Um, and then the final passage says, until men can be raised above defective knowledge and secured against partial and inadequate views, they must continue liable to believe cases and facts and the tendencies of actions to be otherwise than they are. So there you've actually got the word tendency in price. And it's probably worth mentioning that if if one was to ask a sort of typical historian of philosophy what what notion in ethics one associated Ross with, it's true, they'd probably say something like intuitionism. But they would also say uh, the distinction between prima facie duty and uh, duty overall. But it does seem to me that's pretty clearly there in, in price. So he deserves recognition for that. But I also, as I've said, I also believe he deserves recognition for the um, acuity and insight that he shows throughout the uh, review. Okay, well, I suppose you might think, well, you know, this, is, this distinction is so obvious that um, everybody must have recognized it. And um, uh, we, we, we can just move on. But actually, that's not true. So I'm going to, I'm briefly going to show now that Aristotle didn't recognize it. And though I think his account of virtue in the Nicomachean Ethics is the best one we have, it, there are problems with it because of his failure to recognize the distinction. And then I'm going to give you an example in the recent philosophical literature of somebody um, 
I think in a way creating a pseudo problem because they haven't fully recognized the that straightforward distinction. So Aristotle, as I'm sure um, many of you know, uh, is famous for describing virtue in terms of what he called a mean. And the essential idea is, and I think I think he's I think I think it's correct essentially, um, that human life consists in certain spheres and they can be characterized in terms of certain actions or feelings. So for example, um, uh, you know, the, 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 how, how much money you have and what you do with it is quite important. So he has a virtue of generosity. And the virtue uh, lies in a mean. That doesn't mean giving away a moderate amount of money. The mean is getting it right. And it's a mean between getting it wrong. So that is um, giving away money when you shouldn't. And on the other hand, not giving away money when you should. OK, so you might when you first come across the doctrine, you might think, oh, well, I can plot my character somewhere on some kind of spectrum. Uh, but from negative to positive, but you can't. You could well have both vices. And actually, in his discussion of generosity, Aristotle makes that clear, because if, you, if you're prodigal, which is the excessive vice, um, uh, uh, in contrast to the virtue of generosity, you'll give away all your money, but then you won't have any left to give when somebody comes to you in need and you should be giving them money. Uh, so the mean is the mean is um, getting it right on every occasion, and that applies to feelings as well as as actions. So, for example, even temper is get, getting angry at the right time for the right reasons in the right way, and so on. Um, if you're bad tempered, you you do that when you shouldn't, and if you're sort of insensitive, not many people are. Um, Aristotle thinks, but if if you are, you won't get angry. When you should. So that's the doctrine of the mean. As I say, I think it, it is pretty um, plausible. But there is a difficulty. Um, so let me give you a, a sort of um, slightly implausible, but I hope helpful uh, example. So imagine that you have been asked to take a distinguished honor, honored guest to dinner. And you know, you, you've had you've all had a you both had a fair amount to drink and and to eat and so on. And uh, it comes towards the end of the dinner, and you think, well, maybe I should offer this individual a whiskey. That might be a generous thing to do. Um, and you know your guest would would enjoy it, but you have already had quite a lot of drink. So there's a question of temperance here. Would it would it be better not to have the whiskey and and to be temperate? Now let's say the the right thing to do is is in fact to be temperate. Obviously, if you choose that, that's the virtuous thing to do. But what would Aristotle say if? And let's imagine that the, the, these considerations are pretty finely balanced, actually. So though the right thing to do is not to buy the whiskey, you know, there's quite a lot to be said um, in favour of, 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 of buying it. Well, what Aristotle would say if you bought the whiskey is that there's nothing good about it. It's vicious because you've, you've moved away from the mean. So it's in fact prodigal. Uh, and that seems to be a sort of mistake, really. Uh, he 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 should have dealt with that, um, and Price would have been able to explain everything to him uh, much more straightforwardly. So, moving to my conclusion, I I'll now say a little bit about a recent um, example. So this is a, a an article which has received a fair amount of attention in the Journal of Philosophy 2017 by uh, an excellent young uh, philosopher in the University of London called Joe Horton, and he calls it the all or nothing problem. 
Okay, so the problem is this. You've got to imagine that you're in front of a building which is collapsing and there are two children in there. And there's a possibility that you could get in um, to save them. And there are three options. You can do nothing, and that's okay because it would be super derogatory of you to go in. Okay, so it's, it'd be okay for you to do nothing. That's option A. Option B would be save one child, which will involve the crushing of your arms, let's say. Or C, save both children, which will also involve the crushing of your arms. And as Horton suggests, it now seems quite plausible to believe one and two there on the slide it's morally permissible for you not to save the children and two it's morally wrong for you to save only one child and that he says well those those premises seem to imply three you ought to save neither child rather than save only one. And as Horton says, that is quite counterintuitive. I mean, if there was, if you were out there, imagine you couldn't go into the building yourself, um, you know, because you haven't got the strength or whatever. If some other potential rescuer said, what should I do? Um, I'm thinking of going in there to save one child. You'd obviously say, well, why don't you save both? And for whatever reason, they say, no, I'm going to save only one. You wouldn't say, oh, in that case, we'll just stay outside then. You want to encourage them to, to go in. So Horton's solution to that is one star there on the handout. He has one star and three star in place of one and three. If you were not willing to save either child, it would be permissible for you not to save either. But, but because you're willing to save one, you ought to save both. And that allows him to replace three with, because you're willing to save one child, you ought to save both. But if you're not going to save both, you ought to do the next best thing, which is to save one. That is, you ought to save one child rather than save neither. So that sort of does avoid the problem, but it's got its own difficulties. So one star there, involves denying one in cases in which you're willing to save either one or both children. And that's odd because whether an, act, an action or not is supererogatory shouldn't really depend on whether you're willing to perform it, I think. Three, three star is also problematic because it makes your duties depend not only on what you're willing to do, but on, on what you're actually going to do. And I suppose we usually think that duties aren't conditional on people's desires or intentions or their will or facts about what they're going to do or not do. They're categorical. So the, the, the just recognizing crisis distinction provides a perfectly good resolution of this difficulty. And I've, I've exaggerated the case a little bit. So I've, I've got a new one now. So there are now a hundred children in there and they're going to die very slowly and painfully if you don't go in. And there's also a parrot. And the parrot is quite old. It's had a very nice life. Uh, it will die immediately if it's left in there, uh, in the building. If it comes out, it might have another week or so of life and that'll be it. So you've got the children in there, you've got the parrot. You could save both children and parrot, or you could save the parrot, or you could save just the children. So we get one double star. It's morally permissible for you not to save the children and the parrot. Two double star. It's morally wrong for you to save only the children and not the parrot. And I think, yeah, that what that shows is that any reasonable view will not imply three double star. You ought to save neither the children nor the parrot rather than save only the children. We want, and, and Horton says this, we want a view which allows us to encu say encouraging things to the person who is thinking about going in to save the children. And if you recognise the prima facie overall distinction, you can do that because you can say, look, overall, going in there and saving just the children would be wrong. 
you would have committed a wrong there. But it's a mistake to think that you should do anything possible to avoid committing a wrong. There's something to be said. There's a lot to be said for committing this wrong. And your prima facie duty of beneficence explains that. Of course, you would overall be committing a wrong. But you can be encouraged to go in rather than stay outside the house. So I hope um, that's demonstrated the significance of Price's view and how the history of philosophy and contemporary philosophy um, would, would have been better if people had recognised it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, yeah, very interesting paper. Not sure about the parrot. Uh, but, uh, um, yeah. Any questions from the floor or any questions from our virtual audience for Roger? Um, I may have one or two myself, but I um, won't abuse my position as chair slash compare. Um, No offers at the moment, so I'll jump in, Roger. Um, <clears throat> quite a few of the conversations we've had so far have been on, really, the theme that you sort of gesture to at the end there, which is, in a sense, uh, a forgetting, if you like, of price, because, um, you know, further to the philosophical puzzles that you sort of elucidated there, you know, the, the point of the argument in one respect is to tell us, well, you know, Price was discussing these issues in a, a very um, clear and intuitive way back in the middle of the 18th century. And so it is quite surprising when you look at later work in the 20th century and even contemporary philosophy that these, these puzzles appear without reference. I was wondering, uh, as somebody who knows um, quite a bit more than me on the history of, uh, of philosophy, do you have any views on why it would be that Price has been forgotten in that strand of academic life, if you like? Because, you know, we've discussed how it's perhaps um, reasonable to understand why he might have been forgotten in the context of the history of political thought, for example, let's say because, um, as Remy said earlier, he was a bête noire of Edmund Burke, and so, you know, his reputation suffered and duly for, because of that reason. And uh, Marion was speaking earlier this morning about his positioning within the uh, world of Wales and other reasons why he's perhaps been forgotten as a major cultural figure here. It doesn't strike me as obvious as to why that would mean that in the history of moral philosophy, he wouldn't necessarily gain that or have attained that recognition, especially because in some ways he, he sort of stands out. I mean, I may be overstating it a little, but if you look at the general sort of movement of moral philosophy in the 18th century and, you know, sentimentalism and empiricism, you know, Price seems quite significant because he's maybe one of the few figures who, uh, you know, is going against the grain, at least within the British context. So I'd be really interested if you have any views or um, ideas about why that might be. That's a very interesting question. Um, and I'm sure it's multifactorial, and you, you've mentioned some of the, the factors. I mean, I think one of the considerations must be that Price was so brilliant, and he excelled in so many spheres, that people who didn't engage with him closely might have thought he was a sort of jack of all trades and hadn't focused sufficiently on moral philosophy, really, to, to understand it. And there were also, I suppose, religious views, which many people would have um, disagreed with. I, I think your mentioning of sentimentalism is highly relevant because, you know, sentimentalists just wouldn't have any time for Price. And, you know, I think, I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to Price's views, um, but it, but it does, does seem to me that he brings out the problems with um, non-rationalist positions in ethics, especially clearly. So it may, it may be that they just didn't want to take him on because the objections were so powerful. Also, he, uh, at least at certain periods, would have been vying with Kant. Um, 
as rationalists. And actually, it's, it is pretty remarkable how many Kantian arguments there are in price. And who knows how uh, Kant um, came up with them. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a really interesting um, remark. And I see Carl is there, who will be giving a paper in the next session, um, perhaps more in the context of the comparison between Price and uh, Kant in the political sphere. But Carl, I don't know if you'd like to come in and uh, make any remarks in that context. That context. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I can't help but uh, burst in. So thanks for the talk. And uh, uh, I know there are others that are working uh, with uh, Roger, with uh, Ross and uh, also Roger's work that's related to price, but just on the question you asked you about um, why not more attention to price, I have a sad uh, confession. I think uh, the real problem, uh, especially from the wonderful quotes we had today, is that uh, Price was a very good 18th century writer. And in my uh, chores as a co-editor of the history of uh, Cambridge history uh, texts, you know, we had. Uh, uh, many decisions to make and so forth. And I would have loved to have seen, you know, tons of things that we didn't ever put together. Did We did many volumes in that series, but one response I got pretty early on from the press was that, well, you know, uh, 18th century writers, you know, the students, it's just too hard for students, you know, aiming for the American audience or whatever. And um, they're just a, as a general illiteracy problem. I mean, even Hume is not taught that much in American schools uh, in the, at the undergraduate level because students really have trouble reading long sentences, unfortunately. So I don't think, uh, you know, you could have a very intellectual answer about different philosophical schools and so forth, but I think we really have a problem of uh, education or the, the uh, you know, has to be solved at a lot of different levels. And uh, it's a mea culpa. I, I, there were some other figures. I did not have a campaign for price, but I did have a campaign for, you know, various 18th century texts that I thought were just no-brainers. Of course, everybody should have a Cambridge edition of that and so forth, but I'm sorry we didn't make it and we missed our chance. Yeah, I thank you very much, Carl. I mean, that, that resonates um, with me as well. I mean, I, I uh, co-edited uh, A History of Ethics with Daniel Starr for Wiley a short, a short while ago, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we didn't have Price either. Um, his... And his style as well is, it's very good. And in a way, it's very clear, I think, in, in, in philosophy anyway, but it's rather dry. And, well, to be honest, I mean, just as purely from the point of view of style, it's sort of unexciting. And I think probably Sidgwick um, took a lot from Price as far as style goes and that that hasn't done him him any favors either i mean the contemporary view of sidri well christine corsgaard at uh harvard i heard from a student of hers calls him sludgewick <laughs> because you know she thinks he's so boring and um not really worth reading which is i think quite wrong thank you yeah really interesting comments and um yeah, interesting as well when you think about his political tracts, uh, particularly discourse on the love of our country, which is, one might say, you know, very lively prose. Uh, but obviously, that maybe as well just reflects Price's talent and his ability to maybe use different registers and is, uh, I suppose, uh, one of the um, virtues, perhaps, of a, of a brilliant mind of a, of a polymath. Thank you so much, Roger, for your contribution. I, I've got one hand up there. Um, Malcolm Lowe, I think, would like to come in and make a comment or, or raise a question. And if we can perhaps allow Malcolm to uh, provide a word or two, and then we'll turn to our next speaker. Malcolm? Uh, yes, I just wanted a clarification. Uh, it wasn't clear to me in the case of the two children. Uh, are we saying that um, you have the means to save both, uh, but you're only prepared to save one? Or are you talking about the case where you have only the means to choose to save one? Oh, yes, I should have been clear about that. The idea is, yes, you can, you can in the, in the um, first case, you, you could save first uh, both children. You could save both. Yeah, at no extra cost to yourself. 
No, you see. And in my case, you could save the parrot yeah. at no extra cost to yourself. Mm -hmm. I see. All right, thank you. That, that's what I wanted to... to, to uh, that, that's simply what I wanted to clarify. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Diachwal, Malcolm, and uh, lovely to hear from you. Um, it's been it's been a while, and uh, yeah, it's good to be able to connect up, as I said earlier, through the um, miracle of modern technology, and I'm sure Price would approve. So yes, if you don't mind joining me in giving Roger a round of applause and thanking him for his contribution this afternoon. Thank you so much, Roger, for joining us from Italy as well. Um, I'm sure it's a beautiful sunny day out there, so uh, thank you for coming in from the sunshine for a little while to speak to us. Thank you again.